uh, the recording will be available at beep.okstate.edu and you can get on there and listen to it anytime. Please uh, feel free to click the chat button at the bottom and type in a comment or question. We'll try to get those here toward the end to those uh, toward the end of the program. So with, without further ado, uh, Dr. Hart, uh, if you wouldn't mind sharing your screen and we'll start off with your presentation. Okay, we're gonna go from here. Okay. Yeah, it's coming. It's coming up. Yeah. Okay. Do I need to do anything else? No. Just, just, just start your okay. Okay. We'll be talking about multi-species grazing. Let's see here if I can learn how to. Poor guy. <laughs> If I can get to slide two. Okay, there we go. Okay, what is multi-species grazing? Is grazing more than one animal species together on a pasture range? Generally for most people it will be cattle plus something else, whether it's horses, sheep, goats, or deer. And some of y'all have been doing multi-species grazing and didn't even know it. Well, why are we going to do multi-species grazing. Basically, pastures and range grow a diversity of plants, grasses of various kinds, legumes, broadleaf weeds, both good and bad, some with four-letter adjectives, and various woody species. Diversity is good for yield, yield stability, insect and disease resistance, drought tolerance, and soil health. The problem is any one animal species does not consume all of the forage species. Uh, th this is kind of a diagram that gives us an idea about what the different uh, species of animals eat. Uh, it's kind of like tree boards that meet in a corner. One representing grass, one representing droughts, and the other one forbs, which forbs are basically those things called broadleaf weeds. We notice here that cattle will eat a predominance of grass, a little bit of our broadleaf weeds, and a little bit of our brows, depending on uh, the breed of animal and how hungry they are. If we look at sheep species, they're more balanced than eating grass. They'll eat some forbs, and they'll eat brows to about shoulder height. If we look at goats, we see that they eat predominantly brows some of our broadleaf weeds, and some grass. However, goats are quite flexible, uh, depending on what's available uh, that is of high quality. Uh, goats will eat most of your grasses. They really hate Bermuda grass and only eat it as a last resort. When a plant class is not consumed, it dominates the pasture and reduces biodiversity. That is the reason why pastures grazed by cattle only become brushy and weedy, because the cattle consume relatively little amounts of brush and weeds. In the past, this problem ha has been solved by burning and spraying herbicide uh, to reduce great competition by these ungrazed species. Uh, burning suppresses most woody species, but it sure thickens Cerecia lespedeza. And there's always a hazard when burning. Uh, the best thing about burning is when the fire is out and you've had no spot fires. Herbicide often kills the, some preferred species as well as the target species. Cost may be a problem, regulations concerning application and the need for repeat application. We used to mow pastures back before things got too expensive fuel and heavy iron. Uh, and basically mowing and spraying used to control most of our weeds, but things have changed and we've got to change too if we're going to uh, survive. Multi-species grazing is using an animal species that consumes those ungrazed species 
which are increasing, and help to control those species and restore our biodiversity. For example, goats love Cerise lespedeza, so with sufficient goats, they will reduce the amount of Cerise lespedezas, and grass then can compete with the Cerisea and replace it over time, which we've seen in a number of studies. This is not an overnight fix, but spraying isn't either. Uh, the results of spraying look real gratifying, often in the short term, uh, but in the longer term, uh, things come back. Neither ghost nor herbicide will er eradicate Cerisea. It will continue to be present and control will have to be applied indefinitely. Okay, a picture of our friend Cerisea lespedeza. And just to note about it, uh, goats pass by Cerisea lespedeza sprouts when we think that they would be at the most nutritious stage. And they wait till Cerisea gets somewhere around 12 to 16 inches high before they start on it. And they start on it and they basically eat it into the ground. That goat thinks he's in heaven on earth with that field of Cerisea. Okay, that two to three inch green stuff you see in the lower right part of your screen is Cerisea that's been grazed by goats. Basically, we've overgrazed the Cerisea. We've kept it from seeding. We've reduced its uh, plant vigor since it's overgrazed and not able to store enough carbohydrates in the roots. And so after several years, those plants will give up. However, they'll be replaced by the seeds in the seed bank that sprout. Chemical control is kind of expensive, gives us partial relief. There's varying degrees of effectiveness when spraying. Uh, up uh, this is that. Up in Kansas, uh, on study there, we also had a uh, herbicide specialist there that was doing various herbicide treatments on a number of different farms and he, we toured them. And some farms we got good control, some farms that had been sprayed the previous year, it looked like they had no control. But basically, if you're trying to control Cerisea lespedeza with chemicals, you're on the spray go around, treat every couple of years and pay for the spraying. Uh, some of the economic modeling work in Kansas showed that spraying really wasn't economic. Three years of hard grazing by goats, uh, did kill the perennial plants. Great reduction in seeding rate. Uh, and after grazing by goats, only short stem, stem stubs were left at the end of the season. Sheep will consume Cerisea, but not as much as goats. Work we did in Kansas, the producer here had stalker goats, grazed four head per acre. They gained 22 pounds per head made about $10 profit per head, $40 per acre. This producer bought his own goats thereafter. And he said, if he didn't make a dime on his goat project, he said the savings in spraying uh, sure helped his bottom line. Lespedeza has to be one of the best goat forages. Uh, and unfortunately, people wait till they're eat up with Teresa Lespedeza and it's seeded and reseeded and so you have a seed bank then that provides Cerisea indefinitely. On the project in Kansas, and this was done in about 97, 98, 99, before digital cameras, uh, the goats also controlled honey locust, sumac, red cedar. As a matter of fact, when we turned the goats off the trailer, they went past all the other things we thought they would eat, straight to the red cedar killed about 96% of the red cedar in two years. Plum, blackberry, elm, buckbrush, wild rose, dogwood, Osage orange. In general, uh, they uh, don't prefer Osage orange very much. Touch base on hair sheep. I've mentioned sheep being used. Basically, most of the sheep in Oklahoma that are not show animals, are hair sheep. Hair sheep do not have wool. 
Uh, they don't need shearing. Some breeds are very worm resistant because they originated in the tropics. Such breeds such as the Katahdin or the St. Croix. Uh, <clears throat> they're easy to manage. Some call them old man sheep because old man just has to waddle over to the fence and watch them. They take care of themselves. Uh, one of the breeds that is very worm susceptible is the Dorper sheep. Uh, any wool. They're kind of big, they're very growthy, but the worms love them. Air sheep consume most broadleaf weeds. They really consume a lot of ragweed. Uh, they take care of your broadleaf weeds. They will consume browse only about shoulder high. Uh, they're not near as aggressive on Ceresia as are uh, goats. Goats love brush almost as much as they love Ceresia. They stand on their rear legs and consume leaves up to about five or six foot high. They leave a browse line that you can see under. Goats will debark some trees such as black and honey locusts and kill them the first year. Goats kill smaller brush in only a few years. Bigger brush takes a few more years. We talk about what species uh, are controlled by goats. We have to think about what do they learn to eat as a kid. And you get different batches of goats from different areas and their mothers taught them differently. We bring them to a new area and they may not consume some plants readily. Also goats will pass by a certain plant until it gets at the perfect stage of growth and then that day is the day to start eating that weed. So you can't ever say what goats will or won't eat until the end of the year. Goats concern consume at least 90% of our herbaceous and woody species of plants. Very few things that they won't consume. They don't consume mullein. Also, some people refer to it as flannel plant, a uh, broadleaf plant that has kind of white cottony type surface on the leaf. And goats just like to not consume Bermuda grass. As one goat producer said, goats will create a pure stand of Bermuda grass. They'll eat everything else first. Talking in general about goat, what goats will eat, some of their most preferred species include blackberry, Ceresia lespediza, greenbriars, sumac, winged elm, poison ivy, and ironweed. Moderately preferred species would include post oak, blackjack oak, multiplar rose, sunflower, ragweed, buckbrush, hickory, hawthorn, giant ragweed, tall thistle, and eastern red cedar. Lesser preferred species include Osage orange, Illinois bundle flower, and hackberry. One caution, goats are illiterate and they didn't read my list. Especially some plant species taste different in different areas, such as red cedar, also sumac and winged elm. And so, in one area, the goats are consuming that particular plant species. At another area across the state, they're not consuming it. Just a few pictures here, just showing you a picture of a goat on his hind legs up in the tree, getting whatever leaves he can get. <clears throat> one of our research projects, it's easy to tell that the goats were on the right side and the control is on the left side there with sumac. Here we see another area that's been browsed and yet another area that's browsed. And here we see the goats have really decimated that sumac. Some of the red cedar the goats have hit, others. And here's what goats ultimately do to red cedar. They strip the bark on it and kill it. Talk a little bit about co-species Grazing, uh, you'll have to do some facility changes. They talk about the three P's for goats, perimeter fencing, parasite problems, predators. You will have to modify your waters and working facilities. Some ways that you can convert five strand barbed wire fence. If you have a good sound five strand barbed wire fence, one thing you can do is add two or three strands of barbed wire 
Down low so that there's no gap bigger than seven inches and lower 30 inches. Try to get the lower strain within five inches of the ground. Goats go out low, so look down low. Uh, every once in a while you'll get a goat that climbs. Best thing to do is move your barbecue grill over to the fence and let him fall on it and apply barbecue sauce over low heat. That cures fence climbing every time. Okay, you need to use tie wires between the posts because the goats will kind of wiggle their bodies between even a very tight barbed wire fence. Cheaper than putting up a new fence, it can work. Used some before, requires a fair amount of labor to add the additional strands of barbed wire. This is kind of an artist con concept of it. You can three, see three strands of barbed wire, the darker ones that have been added. In general, for most people, the lower strand of barbed wire is high enough, you'll have to add two strands of barbed wire under that, and then one between your first and second strand of barbed wire. Here's a four strand electric fence uh, that we've used an awful lot of for controlling goats. Top strands about hip high, four wires evenly spaced down to the ground. Works well for goats, uh, but you gotta go out and check the voltage every day because the goats will check it. Uh, takes a little higher voltage to keep goats in. We'd like to see at least 5,000 volts uh, on them to keep them in. You can convert a five strand barbed wire fence with adding two strands of electric fence between eight and 10 inches for the lower strand and 18 to 20 inches for the upper strand and eight inches out from the fence so that your electric fence wire doesn't get uh, tangled with your barbed wire. Uh, <clears throat> can be mounted on standoff insulators, step-in post, fiberglass suck rods. Works well, you may have to control the vegetation underneath it. Usually the goats will keep some of the vegetation clipped off. Here's an artist's concept of standoff insulators uh, on a five strand barbed wire fence. But electric fence uh, is just like with cattle, they need to be trained on it before you put them out in it. Because when a goat gets shocked, he will go forward and out. So in a trap, you put a sample of your uh, electric fence up just inside the, the fence of your trap and uh, get your animals trained. You can put, do things like put soda pop cans on them so the animals are curious and will go over and touch the fence. Predators. 10,000 coyotes voted goat meat is the best. However, local dogs cause the most kills. A guard donkey can be effective at preventing predation. I know there's a, just several cattle producers that are using them now to prevent predation on calves. They will work for goats. Dog, guard dogs have been used the most for preventing predation on uh, goats. They do require dog food daily and other animal species to manage, but generally they're very effective. The electric fence can help but you shouldn't rely on electric fence alone. Parasites or worms are a problem when animals are grazing close to the ground. Basically, wherever we have taken goats to use for controlling brush, they've made it through the whole summer without needing to be dewormed because they were not grazing close to the ground. And that's where they pick up larva from uh, when they're grazing within about three inches of the ground. Cerecia lespedeza has deworming qualities and sheep and goats do not need to be dewormed when grazing on them. Uh, <clears throat> basically for goats, you need to check their eyes for anemia for deworming, much like you would check your dog's eyes or some of your other animal species. The uh, mucous membrane around the eye uh, becomes pale because of anemia and animals need deworm. You need to take a parasite management class online or at Langston, uh, the Oklahoma Meat Goat Boot Camp. Uh, they did record parasite sessions on that, and that's pretty good uh, for, for learning about parasites. Dewormer resistance in goats is a big problem. 
it's just beginning in cattle, but it, it's a pretty big problem in goats. Uh, basically, it may require a two or three de dewormer combination uh, to control worms. Maurice Shelton said the only reason God made a goat was to eat brush, and there's a lot of truth in it. Goats just do better where they have some brush to eat. A goat will convert unwanted vegetation into saleable product at a profit. Goats can be sold several places in Oklahoma, Leech, Oklahoma, and Pawnee have auctions. Chickasha, Oklahoma has a goat slaughter house there and give some pretty good prices. Uh, other places adjacent to Oklahoma, such as Gainesville, Paris, uh, <clears throat> Hope, Arkansas, uh, then are good markets for goats. Hamilton, Texas is a slaughterhouse, and if you've got enough goats and he needs them, he'll send a truck to pick them up. Current market price now for 60 pound goat, uh, San Angelo's price is about $3 a pound. So 60 pound kid, that's $180. So you can support a doe and a kid for 12 months and pocket 20 to $50 per head. Half of your goats will have twins, which are even more profitable. Frank Pinkerton said a Texas homily is, ranchers have cattle and horses for reputation and sheep and goats for finances. If you Google Langston goats, that will get you to our website with an on online goat course available. Also, we have a book that's the Bible on goat production that uh, you can purchase. Pennsylvania has a, a very brief online course for goat production. That's good. The Meat Goat Handbook, uh, Raising Goats for Food, Profit and Fun by Von Swede Tucker is good also. Uh, very much oriented towards commercial goat producer. Many of the other handbooks are oriented towards pet and show animals. There's lots of information and disinformation on goats available on the internet probably more disinformation than good information. Before you get goats, visit with other goat producers. You have to realize that three-fourths of the goats are pet, show, or hobby, which is not what you want. Find a commercial goat person for your county ag educator, local feed store, or word of mouth, and visit them. And usually they'll know another producer or two that you can uh, visit also. But uh, collect your information from people that are actually doing uh, goat production. In conclusion, adding sheep or goats to cattle can be beneficial to control unwanted vegetation, as well as beneficial to the bottom line. Outstanding, thank you, Dr. Hart. Um, <clears throat> again, uh, please uh, feel free to type any questions in the chat just click on the chat button there at the bottom of your screen you should it, all of you should be able to should be able to do that so looks like dr hart has uh discontinued his share uh, i honestly i don't have any idea what this little yellow with the red text sign keeps coming up uh, are others seeing that as well yes yeah, okay. I, I don't, I can't tell you what that is. So I don't know how to get rid of it. But if you can ignore it, uh, we'll, we'll just move ahead. So let me introduce uh, uh, Mr. Mike Marker. He is from South Central Kansas and has a ranching operation there with his family. Uh, some time ago, we were uh, college classmates there at Kansas State University. First met then, but uh, we visit on occasion over the phone for uh, various topics. I've enjoyed uh, my relationship with Mr. Marker and his, uh, Mike in particular, and he's gonna introduce his son who's gonna be part of the uh, presentation here. So Mike, it's all yours. All right. Well, I would like to thank uh, Dr. Lawman for inviting us. Um, to have the chance to share kind of what we do and, and what the Lord's allowed. Um, when we were visiting about this, he said just like to share our experience and what's kind of got us to the place we're at and 
when he asked me about that, I said we would be glad to do that. But uh, we always start uh, our uh, visits like this with what kind of got us to this point was uh, I like a lot of young guys out of college. And when uh, Dr. Lawman says uh, a few years back or a short while ago, uh, it was actually quite a while ago now that we were in college at K-State, but got out and did what a lot of us did, um, kind of followed that grab and go mentality and, and uh, got some debt and got a family and got stressed and uh, about got ran over and uh, began to realize that busy is not always best and uh, there's got to be time for family and, and time for faith and over the last several years uh, have really moved from trying to own and trying to grab to stewardship. And I think when we talk about any of this stuff, that's where we kind of got to start um, is what it really means to be a steward. And the word means to care for something of value that is not yours. And that's kind of what we do is care for things of great value that really aren't ours. We get to use them for a while, but they ultimately belong to the Lord. And so we really encourage people to, uh, and if you look around the day you're in, there's not a lot of, foundations that are still very solid uh, you know the airs kind of went out of all the sports balls uh, the markets you know really doesn't know what it wants to do because it doesn't know who's going to be there to to even consume and if it got the money to buy so stewardship locks us into where we should be which is it begins with uh, the lord and a relationship with him through his son jesus and then i care for what he entrusts to me and that really began to change the way we go about things uh, we do have a, we're in South Central Kansas in Cali County, um, have been in the cattle business forever. Uh, now we have a commercial cow herd, we're spring calving, and we have a base red Angus herd that we uh, uh, put Charlay bulls on and get that F1 or that done calf. And the Lord's allowed us to begin to keep those F1 females. And Dr. Lawman and I visited a little bit about that yellow done female several years ago when and um, we're using them now and raising a, an F2 calf. So as we started into this several years ago, uh, we had a little dry spell, nothing like 2011, but, uh, and we began to rotate. Now on a home place here, there's a four pasture rotation that, that we began to rotate in and, and really came through that dry spell with more grass overall than we had when we were traditional grazing. And here's a picture of our Red Angus cows in their uh, Charlotte Cross calves. Uh, and, and we rotated. And then after that, I told my dad that we're going to begin to rotate everything we have. And so now we have four uh, pretty good sized rotations, one of which is the Red Angus females with the Charlotte calves. The other two are, are uh, F1 females with F1 bulls on them. And then the home rotation here, we're going to be running our first calf heifers and their calves on get to rotate everything, which is very rare um, in our area anyway, to have landlords that will let you develop a grazing system that works uh, and, and get to do it long-term. Problem we had was we were still trying to control the brush that uh, Dr. Hart talked about, still doing a lot of spraying, still fighting uh, burning, not as a tool, but as a rule and the risk that comes with it. Here's a, here's a video of our F1 females. And so, about the same time we're struggling with that, Nathan gets out of uh, his education process and wanted to come back home. And one of the things they talk about uh, in a family operation, when somebody comes back home, they need to bring something with them to help that operation stay viable. Because uh, whether we like it or not, it takes more to feed two families than one. And uh, Nathan has done a great job of learning to manage and, and uh, handle goats in the different areas that Dr. Hart mentioned, whether it's fencing or, or the parasites or just handling in general. And so from, from my perspective, uh, it's been a process because I was never really, a, uh, didn't have goats in my mental thought much uh, as a cow guy. But when I began to see what he was doing on a small scale as he was learning, became very applicable on a large scale to what we're trying to accomplish overall. And again, back to that stewardship issue where we have time for the Lord, we have time for our family, and we leave things better than we found them. They've really become a great tool for us in our operation and co-grazing with our, with our cow herd. And that's kind of what got us here. Uh, I'm gonna let Nathan visit now because he is much more able to convey what's going on with the goats 
how that mixes in with the cattle, but it always starts with a relationship with the Lord and then caring for what he entrusts to us and doing the best we can with it. So. Okay. Um, I'm going to try to do this and be able to show some videos at the same time. So um, right now we have basically two of our cow-calf rotations that have goats in them around the goats have access to basically around 750 to 900 acres um, in both rotations. So when we're, um, when we fence a rotation for the goats, the cows we actually rotate and the goats we don't. The, the goats just have a perimeter fence. And so the goats really go wherever they want as Dr. Hart kind of said, the goats are really seasonal eaters. And so they basically my what I've observed is they're grazing in big circles going around the whole eight to nine hundred acres and grazing their favorites one at a time. Um, here you can see kind of what he said. I mean, these goats are athletic, they're able to get up on their hind legs and are really pushing over some of that um, sand plum. There's dogwood, there's the Osage orange, which we call hedge trees. Um, my goats actually love hedge trees. That's one of the things that they go to very first is hedge trees. Um, we'll show some video later. They love the cedar trees. They, they're they eating a cerise wespediza. So that's one of the things that, one of the reasons why we just um, perimeter fence is because the way they eat, they, I, I didn't really want to inhibit them. I wanted them to be able to eat the things that were basically ripening at the time that they wanted it. And so I kind of let them decide when they're, I'm not sure what's going on here, when they're going to graze what. So they graze in the big circle. One of my biggest problems this year has actually been predators. We haven't had a lot of trouble, but coyotes have been a problem this year. I have guard dogs. Um, I think what's been going on this year is the goats are staying in their group, um, but anything that wanders out of the group, any kids that get left behind, the coyotes are just so smart. If there is a group of two or three nannies that go off away from the herd to graze, I think that's where they're getting picked off. I'm hoping to employ some um, seasonal hunting to help the, help the popu coyote population and help kind of narrow that down. Um, I actually see a question right here. I have five guard dogs with that group of basically 150 to 170 goats. We'll top out at 200 in that rotation probably. Um, that can be enough and could not be enough because I mean, like I said, those, those coyotes are just so smart. If anything gets separated, um, once the coyotes figure out that goat meat is good, which it took two or three years, we hadn't had hardly any predation the last few years in that rotation. But I think this year they figured out exactly what is available to them. And so that has changed their diet. Now they're coming and hunting those kids a lot harder than they had in the past. So hopefully with the dogs, the thing about dogs also, if you really need to do your research, there's different types of guard dogs. Um, some species or some breeds tend to stay really inside the herd and they are more perimeter guardians, more like your Anatolian and Akbash. And I'm, I'm thinking that I might need to bring in one of those more perimeter and outlier breeds that do almost a little bit more hunting of those coyotes. We have, um, we actually use some Sarplanic, which is a pretty rare guard dog breed. We also have some Pyrenees crosses and they tend to stay really in the herd. Um, I may need a breed that is gonna be outside which is more the Anatolian. One of the things that I really find interesting is the, the winter grazing. I'm gonna to try to show you a video. Winter grazing is actually when I think they do a lot of their damage. They, in the next video that I'll show you, they actually go back and I'm not going to be able to say it scientifically, but those plants store a lot of their nutrients in that year's growth. There's a lot of carbohydrates, a lot of sugars. And so the goats come back through and they graze a lot of that year's growth where a lot of that sugar and starch is. And everything that the plant did throughout the year then gets taken back again because 
those goats have grazed it off. So the next spring, the plant is going to have to use more of its resources to try to push up to produce all over again. And this is actually the video that I want to show right here. You can see, um, hopefully, there we go. You can see I'm grazing. This is mostly dogwood right here in the winter. And then you'll see some red cedars that they've grazed and barked. So you can see I'm picking off that, um, that year's new growth. If you were in person, you would see the very ends of most of those brush or dogwood plants are kind of red. Um, that's that year's growth, and that's where a lot of those sugars and starches are stored. We saw that a lot with shumac. They grazed it really heavy in the fall, and then they went back to the winter, and they would graze those sobs down. And almost, uh, I mean, the only sobs that were left were probably a foot tall. They would, I mean, they would graze it way down, and they would just chew on those, on those sobs like a candy cane. Um, it was actually really fun to watch. Um, do you have anything to say? Actually, Nathan, uh, so a couple of questions. So in the plum thicket where you showed they had basically removed all the leaf material, but the top of the plant was still green. Yes. Will that go ahead and die? Is it going to take another year or two? What, what's the outcome of that? It's very much, Dad and I were actually laughing because during Dr. Hart's presentation, pretty much everything he had on that presentation is things that we normally talk about. And I completely agree with basically everything that he showed. Um, that dogwood plant, probably the, the shorter ones were probably gone in about a year to three years because they get so much of it done. Um, you'll actually, in some of those early videos, you'll actually see goats, they'll get on their hind legs and they'll push those plants over because especially the dogwood isn't that strong of a plant. When they get their body weight on it, they're gonna use their front feet and they're gonna push it over. And so a lot of those, when you get enough pressure on it, like I don't really have a stocking rate. A lot of people ask a stocking rate and I say it completely depends on your goals and on your pasture. We don't want to influence the, the grass as much as we can because we wanna leave our cattle stocking rate the same. And so I'm very flexible. In that pasture, I need more than I have this year. So we're probably gonna end up with 200 in there. When I get that 200 number, there's gonna be enough pressure on those plants that they're going to want to stand up and push it over to get all of it. And when you're pushing those over, um, you'll, you'll have some breaking of the plants. You'll also have goats. One of them will push it over and everybody else comes and just devours it. And so within um, that probably two to five year range, if you have the right pressure on it, I think you'll see it starting to die. This year, I think in that pasture is year three and year two in our other pastures. And most of the Osage orange or hedge trees are either died, have already died or are kind of on their last leg. You can really see there's a bunch of the, a bunch of the branches are not leafed out. They're actually dead already, but there are some that have tried to leaf out. And that's really, in my opinion, how the goats do their damage is I've observed them circling the pasture. And so basically, they graze it off and then that plant uses its resources to try to reproduce. It tries to push out new leaves or new forage so it can stay alive. And then the goats come around again and they graze it off again. So that plant just wasted all its resources. And then you just keep doing that to the point where the plant can't sustain itself anymore. And so depending on the, the stocking rate you have and the pressure you put on it will probably determine how many years it's actually gonna take for that to, for that to happen. Excellent. So <clears throat> Brian asks, uh, and you've, you've kind of hit on it, uh, but you might, you maybe tackle it from another angle. Brian asks, rule of thumb, uh, maybe Dr. Hart, you can, you can jump in on this as well. Rule of thumb, number of goats or sheep to replace a cow. Let's just assume somebody's just getting started. Uh, where do you recommend they start from a goat versus cow? Uh, stocking rate standpoint. 
if you're running uh, goats with cows, adding goats to cows, you can probably add one goat to a cow for each cow you're running and not miss anything, assuming you have significant brush and weeds for them to, to consume. Uh, if you're re totally replacing cows in an area with goats, you're probably looking somewhere around five goats to replace one cow. Okay, I would agree with that. He's obviously, he doesn't need me to agree with him, but in those rotations, um, we have right now, the one is really, that one pasture is really brushy and we have basically probably about two goats to the cow in that one rotation and we aren't hurting the grass at all. But that's one thing that we're very aware of is how many, and like I said, every year we're flexible because hopefully as the years go by, we get less and less brush. And so theoretically we would have to depopulate a little bit, otherwise we're gonna start influencing the, um, the forage that's available for that cow herd. And so right now we're actually on top of what he said, um, but in the future, as we get that brush under control, I would definitely agree that's kind of what we're seeing. And part of our goal wasn't like a mob graze, you know, where some of this, uh, the custom grazers will come in, they'll dump a whole bunch in for a short time and just wipe everything out. Yeah. Part of our goal is to be sustainable and to do this over time and just slowly build that stocking rate where you start to inhibit the spread and then you start to slowly take that back and then you end up with those brush, you know, the brush in the places that it's not a problem uh, back into the creek beds and down along riparian areas and out of the out of the grass. Uh, so our goal is not to just dump a bunch out and have nothing to do next year. So he's kind of building up to that threshold stocking rate. And one thing you might talk about, Nathan, is beginning about now, you've had, uh, let's say, 100 nannies. But those nannies all had kids, and you're about uh, 1.6 or 1.7 kids per nanny. From here on, those kids are big enough, they start eating. And so from now till frost, your stocking rate increases dramatically as those kids get bigger. And that's when, right now, you're kind of wondering if you're making any progress. All of a sudden, when fall gets here and those kids really start eating, you really make a big step in the next 60 days on the brush that you're getting eaten. So we kid in, we kid a little bit later up here. Um, we start calving heifers in February. Our cows start in March. Um, I don't kid until the 1st of May. That's just my preference. I don't want to have to deal with weather issues. I have too many of them to be worried about that. And so we are, that does make it a little bit challenging because I pull those nannies out of the big pastures during kidding for about two weeks to a month we normally kid about 95% of them in the first heat cycle. So we get them back really quick, but right when I pull them out is when that brush is really starting to go. And so that's kind of the downside of it because when we get them in there, they're almost a little bit behind it. But what he said is really true because um, right now you feel like you're a little bit behind. And if we have 150 nannies down there, the kids are now a month to a month and a half gonna be old. And this is when they really, they've, the nannies have stopped leaving them in nurseries and they're starting to take them with them. Those kids are learning what forages they're eating. They're following mom to learn that. And they're actually not just experimenting. Now they're actually starting to eat. And the first year we had down there, we had like 220 or something like that nannies with kids. And you're really happy with what it's looking like and how things are going. And then I get to about the first to middle of September and I'm like, oh my gosh, because everything was gone. And I still have a month because I don't wean until October. That's when I sell. And I still have a month that I have to do something with. And then I have winter to think about because I don't take the goats anywhere. They stay out on pasture all year round. And so we're, I mean, severely starting to influence or impact the available forage and I still have three weeks until I can get rid of the kids. And so then that was when that was when I had both herds together. So then we split the herds, put them in two separate rotations. So now I've been building both back up separately to that, I think probably around between 175 
to 200 in the rotation that we've been talking about. And the other rotation isn't nearly as brushy. It just has problems in draws and some Osage orange on the hilltops and a little bit of the dogwood scattered throughout. And it really tops out, it's about 800 acres and I think it's gonna top out at about 150 nannies. Um, the one that we've been talking about is probably gonna need 200 for a while. The, the south part of that rotation is all brush and the north part is a lot of cerisa, cerisa lespediza. And so we kind of have two fronts that we're trying to tackle at the same time. And they really like that cerisa, but they, where I take them back to after they've pitted is on the south side of it. And so they have trouble getting to the north side to eat that cerisa until mid to late summer when those kids are really tracking well. I've actually considered placing them north next year. There isn't really a good set of pins to place them in, but we just have to build something temporary so they could really hit that cerisa earlier because that is one thing that I've noticed that Dr. Hart mentioned is it's really good to be able to hit that cerisa before the seeding started because that's when you really influence it. They'll eat it either way, but then you have to worry about the spread and um, that seed bank that he was talking about. So, Nathan, two more questions for you. Uh, one, where, where and how do you market your kids? And secondly, what is your fencing system for the goats? I'll do the fencing first. Pretty much like exactly what Dr. Hart said, um, my smaller pastures that they're gonna be a little tighter in, I have the two wire electric system, um, about eight and 16 inches off the ground. Um, use a electric fence charger you need it to be hot. Um, I, I try to stay above five because I need it to be pretty hot. Um, in the big pastures, in the big rotations, we've actually gotten along really well with just one, just one wire. And most of the time you're gonna be discouraged, kind of like he said, not only learning what an electric fence is, but they are, goats are very homey. And so when you first turn them into a place and they don't know where they're at, First they'll stay there and then they'll start looking. And so we really have to be able to spend some time with them that first couple of weeks, try to get them to learn their boundaries because they'll go right through the electric fence even if it's there for the first week or so until they learn what their boundaries are. Once they learn where they're at and kind of what their boundaries are and that the electric fence is there, we don't have much trouble with it. When they know it's there and it's hot, every once in a while one of them will try and they'll get shocked and they stay in really well. If you leave it off, like I sometimes do, and get lazy or forget to change a battery or something like that, they'll stay in for a month or so, and then one of them will find it, and then you'll spend a week training them back to it because they figured out they could do it. And so it's really good to actually stay ahead of the curve instead of behind. Um, but we've gotten along really well with just that one wire. And I think the key to that is these pastures are big enough and they're not hungry. If a goat is hungry and they start looking, they're gonna get out of whatever you put them in. I've had them in solid woven wire fences and they find a way to get out of it. I don't care if it's a six inch gap at the bottom, I mean, they're gonna get out. And so really being able to provide adequate forage for them is really one of the big keys to keeping them in. The, where I market them, I do a lot of my, I retain quite a few dolings myself. I do a lot of marketing um, through my Facebook page and just in person privately on replacement nannies, um, dolings. I, in the past, have used the Perry Sale Barn, which is now at Pawnee, Oklahoma, and they have a great sale. We took some of our coal nannies there this spring and were absolutely thrilled with what that did for us. Um, the market was really strong and did really well. They attract a lot of good buyers. Last year I was able to, and this is where I want to stay, um, I was able to market those weathers privately through a, a buyer that was either going to take them um, and grow them or take them directly to the slaughterhouse. And that's really where I would like to be. It takes a lot of the stress off because when you're taking them to a sale barn, the years that we've done that, you most of the goat sales are at in the evening, 6 or 6.30, but you have to start at I mean, to get all the goats in and get them sorted and then get down there, it's an hour and a half. Um, Perry was actually two hours. And so you you have to be gone two hours out. And then so you have to be gathering them 
three or four hours out. And so it just makes for a longer day. It makes for more shrink. If I can, it's just more dollars lost because you have commission and commission is worth it if it's a good sale. But if I can cut out the middleman and do it privately in the country where there's a little less stress, that's what I would personally prefer. And we've kind of found that um, on both sides, both with the weathers and with the dolings. I'll still take any coal nannies or anything that doesn't go on the load or doesn't get sold as replacements. I'll take those to Pawnee. Excellent. Well, next time you do, come see me on three miles west. Okay. I think we actually went by you about almost a month ago now. I went down past there to pick up some billies, and Dad actually asked. We at least saw Oklahoma State Research Facility and some stuff, so we wondered if you were around there or not. Yeah, not far away. All right. Well, our time uh, our time has been well spent here today. Thank you, Dr. Hart. Thank you, Nathan. Thank you, Mike, uh, for investing your time in this event. Uh, appreciate all the participants, the questions, the comment. Uh, Yvonne's got some good comments on there. She's from Montana, a goat breeder up there. Uh, uh, Yvonne, you might just put your, you go ahead and feel free to put your website on there if you'd like to. Maybe some people go check, check out some of the things that you're doing from a multi-species grazing standpoint. Okay, uh, next week, Thursday, um, July 9th, Dr. Casey Olson from Kansas State University. Uh, he's been doing some, some unique uh, research with combinations of fire and herbicide uh, combinations, trying to find that sweet spot to help control Cerecia lespidiza in particular. He may talk about some other ongoing research that they've got going on up there as well. But he's got some really good stuff. I think you'll enjoy it, benefit from it, and we certainly hope you can join us then. Thank you for your participation. that has been a, a great session. Thank you again to uh, the Marker family and to Dr. Hart. Hope to see you next week. Thank, Thank you. you, Dr. Loman. Absolutely.